Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of Social Theory. I am your host, Thomas E. Hanna, founder of blogphoto.tv, and I am super excited about today's show because we are sitting down with one of the uh, major leaders of thought and um, all sorts of stuff when it comes to search and social media and in particular personal branding. But before I introduce him to you, I do want to remind you that this is an interactive show and there's two ways that you can join in on the conversation. The first is to leave a comment right below if you're watching on the Google Plus event page. Just leave a comment right there on the event page. We are tracking those. We will be bringing those in, particularly in the second part of our show where we answer your questions directly. If you're not on the Google Plus event page, if you're watching from the website, you can still interact. Simply tweet your questions to hashtag STshow, and we will make sure that we bring those in and engage with those as well. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to the man of the hour. He is the Senior Online Marketing Director for Stone Temple Consulting. He's been a speaker uh, for Moz. He's been published all over the web. And in fact, when Google decided to do away with authorship, before they announced it to the rest of the world, this was the guy they called to give them the inside scoop on it. And so let me introduce you to Mark Traphagen. How are you doing, Mark? Hey, Thomas. I'm doing great today. We, uh, we survived the great uh, ice storm of uh, 2015 here, which, as I say, since I travel back and forth to the Boston area every month, I say, uh, the, you know, a quarter inch of ice here, that's our six feet of snow down here in North Carolina. Yeah, see, I don't like ice or snow, but I can tell you that ice hurts a lot more when people throw it at you. So I, I would go with snow over ice if I had my choice. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad that you're on the show. Now, you have, like a lot of people that I've talked to that are really involved with social media or search or online marketing, this was never your intended destination. This sort of arose a series of events where you found yourself in many ways as the expert and one of the uh, significant leaders in your field. But can you share with us a little bit about your journey from where you were to where you are now? Well, a lot of people I think have heard that story, so I don't want to, want to blabber too much. But I think pertinent to our conversation today was uh, that you know I kind of stumbled upon this uh, relatively late in life. I was was in uh, in graduate school, actually in seminary, as you and I were talking about before, since we share that in common. Um, it was my midlife crisis, and uh, just as a necessity of getting a job, ended up doing online marketing for a campus bookstore. Uh, something I'd never done before, even though I was very involved in internet, internet community, all sorts of things, back to its almost beginnings. But uh, that combined with a teaching background, a background in sales uh, from my earlier years, it kind of all came together. And once I got a taste of this world, I realized, like, this is cool. It's kind of fun. I get it. I want to learn about it. And so I began to do that. I had the great fortune of being hired uh, after I left school by a fantastic marketing agency here in the Raleigh-Durham area, formerly known as Verante, now known as Angular Marketing. Uh, tremendous people who uh, I got to learn a ton from, uh, who were very generous with my time to let me pursue things I was interested in. And uh, long story short, uh, I guess it's the teacher background in me, it's, it's the ham in me. When I learn something, I want to share it. And so I began to blog for the company regularly. That led to speaking engagements, first at you know just local conferences and meetups, then at regional conferences, and then at larger national conferences. Uh, began creating content, as you said, you know, writing for other publications, and uh, you know discovered that there were people who were interested in what I had to say, uh, and just kind of kept feeding that beast, and it led directly to the opportunities that I'm enjoying today. Which are manifold, yeah. I, I think. It still blows my mind, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, that you were the guy, because you were known for Google authorship, and that you were the guy that they called that change. But that also raises an interesting question, because uh, one of the things this past year that I've really admired about you is your fluidity. 
because you were, even though even though you um, knew about and were heavily involved in a variety of areas, you were kind of known as the Google authorship guy. And so I know that when they did away with authorship, that you began getting flooded with people who were asking, well, what are you going to do now, Mark? And in the process of that, you transitioned uh, rather seamlessly a focus on Google authorship towards the, the focus on personal branding um, and thought leadership and re, uh, reoriented your online community around that and really made that shift very easily. For those of us that are on uh, social media and there's an awareness that this industry changes very, very quickly. And if you get pigeonholed in one area, that can be uh, your doom if you can't move out of that when that changes. How are you able to transition so seamlessly into uh, becoming, in many ways, the personal branding advocate that you are now? Well, that didn't happen overnight. It might have appeared that it did. And I did indeed get, you know, uh, I, I got dozens of comments, both publicly and privately, when it was announced that authorship was dying, from uh, everything ranging from people with genuine concern for me, saying, oh my gosh, Mark, what are you going to do now? Are you going to be lo looking for a job? To very snarky people saying, like, so, you're going to be looking for a job? Uh, and I got both. But the, the truth is that I think uh, it's very, very important to always keep yourself multifaceted. It's kind of like, I, I don't know anything about fighting, boxing, that sort of thing. But from what I do understand, you know, boxers who, professional boxers who are really good at their game, um, they know how to move and they, they know how to be flexible and they know, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of always going side to side. And so even before the Google authorship death came about, I was already thinking deeply about what is the lar what are the larger implications of this? And as things started to wind down the second, first half of last year, that became even more important to me because start thinking about what if Google did kill this thing? You never want to make yourself totally dependent on somebody else's territory. So I began thinking, you know, whether Google authorship or not, there are bigger, there's a bigger picture here. There, there is a subject matter behind this that is powerful. The whole reason Google tried the experiment and did it for three long years was they realized that. They realized there is something to that personal connection that people make with the author, the creator of content that's valuable to them that could be valuable to people in search. And so I began to think about that in a broader context. That, that's kind of the, the simple answer. There was a lot more to it, but the simple answer to that. I was already thinking about it ahead of that time. Well, so let's talk then a little bit about, about personal branding. Um, when you say personal branding, what do you mean by that? What is personal branding? I'm glad you asked that question because uh, people who have looked at our uh, thought leadership and personal branding community here in Google+, if you go back in the history of that, when we started that in the middle of last year, you'll see I think probably about the first 20 or 30 posts are all about arguing about uh, the definitions of those words or uh, people just saying how much they hate those words. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had to, I actually think I put in the uh, introduction to the community that I sort of reluctantly use those terms because of the terms that people are familiar with, personal branding, thought leadership, at the same time realizing that they're somewhat charged. They sound egotistical, they sound self-centered, they sound like, hey, I'm going to be about me, me, me. But a personal brand is nothing more really than just, it's the same thing as a corporate brand in one sense, and that is it is how other people perceive you, what they think about you. And I think that's the most important lesson to learn about a brand. A brand is, no matter how hard you try as a brand to build it around certain ideals or say like, this is what we represent, this is what our brand is about, at the end of the day, the only brand that matters is the brand that people perceive. Now. What personal brand brings in, and this is what I'm mostly talking about these days, is that word, the personal, that you can bring that in and say it matters who says something as much as what they say. The what they say has to be there. You have to have some substance. You have to be sharing something that truly adds value to people. But connected, when you connect that with a personality, with somebody that people want to be around, want to hear from, want to see more of, 
want to get close to. I think that can be a very, very powerful connection. In, in fact, one of the quotes I shared from you, and I, I went through your material in preparing for this, um, and pulled out some quotes that I shared as quote graphics. One of, in one of them, you actually make this comparison. I think it was on what you, uh, the article you wrote for Moz uh, at the end of last year. You make this comparison between the need for community in how uh, humanity began to gather in terms of the foundations of civilization and you drew this contrast between that and uh, our branding empire. This idea that at the heart of much of who we are is this desire to be connected. And when you have this blank face of a brand, you don't give much that people can connect with. But when it becomes a face that's attached to that, when it becomes a relationship that's attached to that, there seems to be this very different uh, response to how people interact with that. Now, I've also noticed, though, in talking about personal branding, there's really kind of two major sort of groups. Uh, one of them is the personal. It's the, the one that is a, a solopreneur. They have their own uh, company. They, they are the brand, in which case personal branding is a little easier there because the two are almost inseparable. But you've done something really unique with Stone Temple Consulting in that Stone Temple is a team of people. It's not just a single person. And in fact, the CEO and founder is Eric Enga. And yet, you have integrated your personal brand with building up the uh, authority and the expertise of Stone Temple Consulting in light of the entire, uh, the entire organization. What are some of the challenges that you've been hit with in terms of pushback against individuals within organizations trying to brand themselves in connection with that company? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, Eric understood this instinctively, first of all, because he built the entire Stone Temple Consulting business on a personal brand, on his personal brand. Um, you know, from his earliest days, he took every opportunity to be writing about what he knew, to be speaking at, at conferences, do all the things I was talking about earlier. And eventually, you know, parlayed the relationships that he built into the um, uh, the opportunity to write a book together with Rand Fishkin and other well-known names in the SEO industry called The Art of SEO, which is coming out in its third edition uh, sometime this year. So all of that together, you know, made him into a trusted authority that people wanted to do business with. So he understood the power of that. And... But he knew that, you know, he as CEO of a, of a growing company with all the responsibilities he has, he's only be able to take that that so far, and he's looking, thinking about, you know, how do I um, scale this? How do I expand this? Well, he got to, he came onto Google Plus, he got involved, he saw what I was doing. We got to know each other. We worked on some projects together. Over time, the first thing that happened, this is very important, is we built a relationship. We became friends online, and out of that, we discovered that we thought similarly, not exactly the same, but similarly about a lot of things. We had the same approach. We had the same outlook on how um, SEO and social marketing and content marketing and all these things work. And he saw the content in the audience that I had. So uh, long story short, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse eventually. And that really that offer uh, wasn't you know so much the money or the other whatever perks of the job. It was it was to work with him in Stone Temple Consulting, to have the honor of having my personal brand associated with such a trusted brand like that, both as, both as a company brand and the personal brand of Eric Enga. But Eric was very smart. In, in a sense, he was buying my audience. Uh, it was, you know, whatever he pays me was worth that to him in the beginning, just that to bring in, because he knew the audience that I had developed would intersect with his. So I guess the, the bigger, you know, uh, transferable lesson for people there is that it is possible uh, if you if you get this concept and you want to make it work for your brand for your business, if you say like I'm not that person, you know I don't I don't like being on camera, I don't I don't really write or whatever it is, if you can find somebody out there that, who you have a relationship with, who you trust, who you uh, know understands your business the way you do, and you can incentivize them into a partnership or even bring them into your business, and they have that ability to become that personal brand for you you've just bought a very powerful asset. Mm -hmm. Well, and 
Now, I know you talk about this a lot at different conferences and stuff, and I also know that you get, in, in some circles, maybe it's lessening now, but at one point you would get a lot of pushback from this, particularly from companies that viewed this as a threat. If we allow our employees to represent our brand, you know, that can be really bad because we can't control them. How have you responded to things like that? Well, I don't want to be flippant about that because I think in some cases it can be a, a real objection. And it, it can, what, I mean by, what I mean by a real objection is, it, you know, sometimes it's just out of fear, an irrational fear. Sometimes it's out of some substance. And this is something that, that Eric Enga has uh, talked with me about, and I'm going to be developing some content in the months to come about this because we need to realize that things like my Moz poster, in a sense, they're the moonshot. They're holding out an ideal. But not every brand, every company is ready to do that. Not all of them have the resources to do it. Not all of them have the culture to do it. So it can be an aspiration. So there might be some steps along the way. But I would also say this, that uh, if that's the attitude that I get, if it's like, oh, no way. No way we'd ever have any person representing us <laughs> with their face line because you know, we're afraid of what they'd say. Um, I think a lot, you're, I see you smiling. I think a lot of the audience would get this, is saying like, then you've got a deeper problem in your company that personal branding is not going to solve. Um, the companies that are successful with this kind of these personal brand representatives, these PBRs as I'm calling them, are companies that have a culture where um, employees have a reason to be passionate and excited about the company, about the brand, where they would be talking about it online even if they weren't paid to do that. <laughs> they are do it on their own time. When you've got that kind of culture, then you can develop, I think, this kind of thing. There's a lot more we could say about that, but I think that's the, that's the primary thing. And the other thing to people who say, like, well, you know, I can't do this right now, that's okay. Take the baby steps toward it. The end of my, my article on Moz about this that I'm sure we'll, we'll provide a link to, I think it may already be in the, um, in the event here, um, that the end of that article uh, gives some baby steps that you can take in this direction that will be helpful until you can really get there. Yeah, it's not it's not in the uh, event description yet, but I think I know the article you're talking about. We can track it down right after the show and put that in the comments. I think that would be a good read. Uh, now, I want to I do want to bring this back though and tighten up a little bit because I know that a lot of the folks that are are watching um, aren't actually leading a giant organization. They are individuals that are trying to figure out how to position themselves in a way. Uh, to build their personal brand. So if you could give someone like me advice on how to make connections in such a way that reinforces your personal brand, what would be some uh, what what is some of the advice you might give? Well, first of all, you know, you, you said a person like me, meaning a person like you, um, I would tell your audience um, watch what Thomas does. Do what he does because <laughs> I know, you know, you you get this Thomas. You do it so well. Um, you got quickly on my radar screen, and I, and I think it's an important story to tell, when you uh, kind of first became really active on Google+, you were one of those people that I picked up on very quickly. And you know, it's because I saw, like, first of all, there's some substance there. Uh, the guy knows what he's talking about, and that's that can't be faked. But also, uh, you you got how to use your uh, your personality, um, your authenticity, your, your love for talk. You obviously have a you know love for talking with people, love for engaging with people. Uh, I could see you knew how to use that very effectively. So that's something anybody can do. Now I say when I say anybody again, I want to be clear. Um, in my in that Moz article again that we'll share later, uh, toward the end I say there are certain qualifications for somebody who really wants to have an effective personal brand. Some of them you can develop. Well, all of them you can develop to a certain extent. Some of them are kind of you got them or you don't. But one of those is, is that might surprise people. I'd put this first, but it's just likability. Um, be likable. I'm like, study that. I study that. I mean, I think I'm a pretty likable person, and people tell me that. But I've learned to become self-critical. Uh, I don't mean that in a negative, depressing way. I mean to evaluate myself. And I've learned to take a step back, and I can see when I'm being a jerk. I can see when I'm losing patience or being less than likable. And I try to take a step back and look at that and say, how can I be better at that? Um, but if you can find a way 
even in small ways, as a small business person or as even a solopreneur, if you can find a way to begin to build real relationships online where you earn the right to share your knowledge, share your expertise, share what you do, what makes your business or whatever you do special, your service special, with people where you earn that right, that can be extremely powerful. I want to quickly tell a story. I know I've told it before. Some people in the audience may have heard it, but I think it's so powerful. And this goes back to my childhood. I, I think this is an influence because it's such a powerful memory that influences what I do today. When I was a kid, you know, this is before the internet uh, and that stuff, you know, the radio was very important in our lives. And uh, in our house on Saturday morning, we're doing the chores, we're, we're doing whatever, you know, doing whatever we have to do around the house, the radio is on. My mom, every Saturday morning without fail, in North Jersey, listened to this weekly call-in gardening show. And it was a guy who was the owner of a local greenhouse, just, you know, another greenhouse uh, garden center kind of thing you'd have in the suburbs, like dozens and dozens that were around. But every Saturday he was on the air for three hours answering people's questions. And he had personality, he was fun, he had a good sense of humor, but he knew what he was talking about. People truly got help. Well, my, I'll never forget this. My mother would tell me, we'd get in the car later that afternoon, Saturday afternoon, she'd need some stuff for the garden, and we would be driving and she'd say, like, look, Mark, you know, there's a garden center, I'm driving past it. There's another garden center, I'm going past that one. She'd drive miles out of her way to go to his garden center because, one, he'd been an expert, he'd been an authority, and she knew she could trust him to know what he was talking about, but two, through that radio show, she felt a personal connection with him. She liked him and wanted to do business with him. I think that's something that any business person can take advantage of. So I heard four things in there. So let me see if we can if we can distill this out of the story that you shared. I heard, first of all, likability. Uh, secondly, I heard um, genuine relationships. And actually, not. that's always a challenging one because... And I'll tell you, and I know you get this, because this frustrates the snot out of me, is when I talk to people, you know, about the, the power of actually building relationships with people. And what they hear is the power of acting like you're relating to people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's always a challenging one. And what we mean when we talk about relationships are not let me act in a way so that you kind of feel connected to me, but... Rather, let me genuinely build a relationship with you and who you are. Uh, so I heard likability. I heard that. I heard genuine connection. I heard expertise. You need to know what you're talking about. And I heard uh, value that you're actually providing something that helps people. Those are the four things I got about that story. Would you agree? With, would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I think that's a very good summary. And I love what you just said, Thomas. It's so important because what can get lost in this and, and some of the cynicism and kickback that I get. On, on this, when we talk about this, is people assume when they, as soon as they hear the word brand, they assume it's an act. You're talking about, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put on makeup, I'm going to put on clown shoes and a red funny nose and, and be somebody else. And with the, with the internet the way it is today, that works less, or maybe better to say that's so much less effective than it ever might have been before. Um, you can't, you know, pull the wire. I make the comparison a lot to the, the Mad Men days when, uh, you know, all you had to do was uh, come up with a branding message and you could control that entirely because there was no two-way communication. There was no interface. So you just put out the brand message and it was highly controlled. Can't do that these days. So that's the part that I say is hardest because it's harder to develop it. Uh, this is not just something like you put on, you know, you take a, you take a course and you say, like, now I'm a likable personal brand. Um, you know, if you're a, if you're a jerk <laughs> and you can't get over being a jerk, the acting isn't going to cover that. It's going to come out. So I, I just want to say, you know, emphasize that in all those things, we're not talking about building an act. We're talking about being genuine. But at the same time, as I said earlier, I think it is a skill you develop. And the primary way I develop the skill of that is by being intensely self-reflective. Mm -hmm. Looking back, when I have an encounter with somebody online, good or bad, I try to take a moment and think about it. You know, why did that go good or why did that go bad? What can I learn from that? Trying to break out of the, well, that, you know, that guy was obviously an idiot or a jerk, 
and, and come back and say, like, what did I do wrong or what did I do right? And so that's where I think you can learn this and it become a self-learning mechanism. And I like the fact that that's an intentional process for you because that's not, uh, for many of us, introspection is not an easy thing. It's not a natural thing. It's something that you have to uh, first make a decision to do and then secondly, not just say, well, is it possible that I did something wrong here, but actually say in some somewhere in here, there's an area where I could have improved on this and then ferret that out, which is different than saying, well, is, there, is it possible that maybe I wasn't angelic like I think I am. Uh, we do have some, I do have some great comments. We have a fantastic group of folks here that are, I can see in the audience. Eileen Smith, uh, Marilyn Moran, Missy J. Uh, I'm seeing Almi, I'm seeing uh, Andrea Beltrami. We've got some, fan, some fantastic folks in here, but there were a couple comments that tied right in with some of the things you were saying, so I just want to share these here as we approach the halfway. Uh, Marilyn Moran, I, I love this comment because it really ties into a different area. Uh, she says that likability is so important, so she really resonates with um, what you were saying. She says, likability is so important. I learned that early on when I was a nightclub DJ in Philadelphia. So this isn't just how do we do this online and in social media and, and those type of things. She's even connecting this ability to make connections in with somebody who sits in many ways, who's, who a large part of what they do is sitting behind a, a booth and controlling the music that people have. Can I, can I jump in, Thomas, and make a point that, about that for a moment? Um, I never knew that. I, I kind of know Marilyn Moran from around Google+. Plus. I never knew that about her. That is so fascinating. Instantly, I want to hear that story. You know, I, I want to be on a hangout where I hear about her early days as a, as a nightclub DJ in Philadelphia. But th I brought that out, and I want to emphasize that, because that is part of what's so important about making these personal connections and these relationships. Some people say, you know, especially if you're, uh, if you're on social media for a business, you're representing a business like I am, you should only be businesslike. You should only ever share business content and expertise and you know, don't share anything personal, anything about your life because that will, you know, people don't want to see that and I say BS on that. Um, what, you know, I've found that uh, obviously most of what I share is business oriented or marketing oriented, whatever you want to call it. But I do, anybody that follows me on any of my online sources knows that, you know, I'll share something about my grandkids. I'll share something funny that I saw. I'll share something insightful that's not from the world of marketing, just from the regular world, because I'm a real person, and I think people value that. So, you know, for Marilyn Moran, you know, if if I'm following her, the fact that that um, she doesn't look like you look at her avatar, you know, stereotyping. I know, but it doesn't look like the, she looks like the last person in the world you'd guess was a nightclub DJ in Philadelphia. <laughs> you know, I want to hear that story, and when I hear that story, it makes me have a deeper personal connection with her that's going to affect me in the future when she's sharing business tips or she's sharing things that you know about her expertise. Well, and I think I think that's stories are so powerful, and we talk about that a lot, uh, but. That ability and the way that that strengthens connection, I think, is is really critical. And I love that, that you made that connection right there. That was great, Missy J. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, Missy has some questions. We're going to come to those questions a little bit later, Missy J. Eileen uh, um, also comment on this, which ties back to what we were talking about in terms of providing value. Uh, when she comments and you see, she says that you have always been generous with sharing great content, and uh, she has learned a ton from you which goes back to that generosity you were talking about a moment ago and the ability to share and engage with things that bring genuine value with, to people as opposed to saying, hey, I've got some great stuff. If you hire me, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> you know, that, that is an, there's another key, you know, I was about that. And first of all, let me say back at you, Eileen Smith. Uh, you know, I've learned things from her and she is the epitome of a generous person. She's, she can say that because she understands it. But it is a key point to make, and I've uh, I've written about this in the past, that, uh, and I'm not alone in understanding it certainly, but there is a a strange thing here in the in this online marketing world, especially in, in the personal branding, the relationship marketing world, where uh, you you win ultimately by giving away as much as you can, um, 
and again, this is another you were talking. We were talking earlier about people, you know, brands being afraid of a personal brand representing them for what might happen, what might they say. Um, companies can also be reluctant to share knowledge because they say, like, that's what we get paid for, right? Um, you know, especially if you serve clients, if you're a knowledge-based business. But here's what we've found. Um, first of all, you're not going to get any attention these days unless you're helping people. Um, it does not work at all anymore just to put out ads saying, we're the best blank company in the business. You know, that doesn't mean anything to anybody anymore. You've got to, you've got to demonstrate to them that you have some substance, and the only way you can do that is by giving away knowledge for free. The other thing about it is that I don't worry about it because if you really know your stuff, if you're really an expert at what you do, now I know what I'm saying now applies mostly to consulting type businesses or knowledge based businesses, but I think it's a broader application. If you're really the best at what you do, you're really good at it, and you can demonstrate that by helping people, there are going to people be people out there always who will say like, you know what? Sure, I could read all your blog posts, I could, you know, read all your Google Plus posts, I could, you know, get all the instructions and do this on my own, but I don't have time to do that. You know, I'm running a business here. I'm gonna hire you because you've shown me you know what you're talking about. I need your help. And that's always worked for us. We've never had any lack of tremendous clients knocking at our door, not because they said like, you know, okay, it's all there in your blog post, so I could do it myself, but the 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 proof is in the pudding. You have to have the pudding out there. So that's why we share. That's what we do. What we do. That's why we help people. And we help people because we like helping people. Yeah. For bad reason. <laughs> Which goes back into genuinely enjoying what you do. Now I'm going to come back. We're going to put a pin in that for just a moment. Come right back to that. But it we have just passed the halfway point in our show according to the social theory big green clock. Do you know what that means, Mark Trap Hagen? I I kind of do know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> that means it is time for. This or that. Well, this is the part of our show where we get to learn just a little bit more about our social media leaders by asking them a series of this or that question. I draw these questions from my own deck of Would You Rather cards, which I will randomly draw, and it will cover four topics. The first is fear or discomfort. The second topic is appearance or embarrassment. The third is ethics or intellect. And the fourth is a random question. Now, you, Mark Trapp Hagen, have to choose uh, this or that with each question and then let us know why you made that decision. Are you ready to play? I'm ready to play. All right. Well, let me kind of randomize these here a little bit and I'll draw this and we will get Started. All right. Would you rather? <laughs> Question number one. Would you rather feel snakes crawling across your feet and ankles or feel ants crawling in and out of your nostrils? Ooh, I'll take the snakes for $1,000, <laughs> Alex. Uh, obviously, that's, you know, that's a tough choice. It's meant to be. Um, I, I think for me, little tiny creepy crawly things are creepier than anything big. I, I would have to agree with you. That and anything that goes into my nose freaks me out. It doesn't have to be a lot. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, you know, I have no idea what this reveals about me. I don't think I want to know. <laughs> well, we can hypothesize that about later. Anybody who's watching this, if you want to share in the comments what you think that reveals around Mark, you go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Within reason. Moving on, <laughs> question number two. I know you're married, but were you single? Would you rather date someone who talks too loudly or someone who looks like she is constantly staring? There's, there's not a none of the above on any of these, are there? <laughs> no, it's this or that. Not this or that or none of them. Yeah. All right. I'll take the person who talks too loudly if they have something exciting to say and we're in a very noisy bar. And we live in a very, did you say and we in live a very, in a very noisy bar? In a very noisy bar, talking too loudly can be a valuable skill. Yes, this is true. This is true. And particularly if it's a packed bar. Uh, but, you know, hypothetically speaking, of course, 
<laughs> my family, I come from a family that speaks too loudly. So I'm all about speaking too loudly. When uh, my when my grandmother was actually uh, in, in hospice and near the end of her life, I went to visit her and I couldn't figure out where she was, but I could hear my mother talking to her and was able to follow her voice to find her room. That's, that's the family I come from. <laughs> All right. Um, you'll enjoy this one. Question number three. Would you rather... Have all laws created and administered by entertainment celebrities or by construction no. workers? <laughs> I, I, you notice I answered that one before he finished. <laughs> I, buzzed, I buzzed in since we're playing Jeopardy here. Um, so the, the second choice was construction workers? Yes. Yeah, come on. That's, that's the obvious answer. I mean, Joe the plumber, right? Now they know what's going on in the real world. Come on. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, but then you have Arnold Schwarzenegger, who is, you know, gover governor of California. Yeah. <laughs> My point. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. <laughs> Good talk. <laughs> okay, question number four. Uh, the last question. Would you rather help someone move into a new house once or pick someone up from the airport 15 times? I know there's no depends on this, <laughs> but uh, I've had, you know, it sounds like it'd be easier to help somebody move one time, but all of us if we're old enough, have probably been experienced the move from hell, uh, which is, you know, to me is the person who says, like, ah, come help me. You know, I've got lots of people coming, and we're all set to go. And you get to the house, and you're the only one that showed up, and they've got nothing packed. So given that uh, fear from the past, you know, I'll choose picking somebody up in the airport 15 times because I've had a lot of some of the most interesting conversations I've ever had by volunteering to pick somebody up from the airport. So that's more likely to be the plus for me. Uh, yeah, I, I can, I can see that. I can see that. Although, oftentimes with moving in, they they buy you pizza. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no pizza with the airport ride. Now you've just muddled the whole. Thing. <laughs> now I just messed it all up. Huh? <laughs> oh, all right. Well, this has been this or that. Thank you for playing. I think we have. Uh, gotten to know aspects of you that were unexpected for this show, but that's fun and exciting. Now we want to switch on over to uh, the real practical ways that we can begin to apply some of this personal branding, and we have a ton of questions that have been building up from the audience here, so I want to go ahead and dive into those and get some of your feedback on these. Uh, Mark, some of these are comments, some of these are questions, but I tried to mark the ones that I really think tied in with some of the stuff you were saying. Bob Strassel uh, it says this. He says that besides expertise, personal branding seems to also be about sharing the side of you that makes you human and likable. And the great example with Marilyn. But but talk to us about this the side of you that makes you human. That kind of ties in with what you were discussing just a moment ago. Yeah, I think that's you know again, it's, it's a lot of what we've been been talking about here. That uh, what you're what you're doing is you're bringing that. And this is my really my whole point. If you wanted to boil it down to one most important thing, is you're bringing in the powerful human connection in to play with your marketing message. Hmm. Um, so whether you're just representing yourself, your purely your personal brand really is personal. It's all about you, what you do, or whether it's part of something bigger, like you represent a company or you represent a a great nonprofit organization or a cause or whatever it might be, that you're, uh, you're understanding that at the end of the day, even in high fluting, you know, business to business situations, uh, corporate offices, the level, you know, we, Stone Temple's consulting clients are Fortune 500 companies, and we still understand that at the end of the day, there is always a human element involved in any decision. Even the decision to implement, you know, a $500,000 SEO contract. Um, people are influenced by, they want to do business with people that they know, that they trust, that they like, and who they think know what they're talking about. That's, you could boil this whole hour down, I think, into that. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. And I think, uh, looking at the comments, you have a number of people that 
tend to really agree with that. Uh, Andrea Beltrami, she says that gone are the days when personal nuggets are going to do damage. Honestly, I'm turned off by anyone that never shares anything personal. I can't relate to a brand. I can only relate to people. Okay, more like badasses. That's that's. I don't know if you have interacted much with uh, with Andrea. That's her thing. Badasses. The badasses of social media. But she's pretty awesome with that. Marilyn Moran came back. Go ahead. I say I promise. I promise I will not display my badass at any time during this. Uh, this is a video conference. So. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep. We'll keep your badass off the video camera. I appreciate yes. that. Yeah, um, <laughs> wow, this has taken a whole different turn. Uh, Marilyn Moran. Um, here's your personal sharing. Marilyn Moran uh, came back. She said she. Uh, referring to your discussion on um, on the DJ. So let's connect about that in the future. Uh, but yes, relationship building online or offline, it's the same thing. You are and should be the same person. Be yourself. Now that to me that brings up a really interesting point because when we engage with social media, oftentimes we try to. Uh, the relationship building and connection process, we, we try to like reinvent it as opposed to connecting with people the way we would connect with people. Do you think it's possible to build relationships online in a similar fashion to the way you build them face to face or in person? Well, it's, it's more challenging, um, that's for sure. And I'm not always going to uh, say that they're the same thing exactly. Obviously, in, you know, this has been talked about ad infinitum, but the medium that we're on right now is a big help to that. The fact that the internet anymore isn't just text-based forums, but there's all kinds of ways to connect with people, and that you can connect with people both in these uh, public video chats like a hangout or in uh, similar private opportunities, uh, that there are ways to, uh, to get to know people's voice. And it's so powerful once they do to get to know people's face. You know, I think it's why right now we're investing a tremendous amount in video, and especially you know, short video is well produced. Because even though I know it's still a, a, primarily a one-way form of communication, it's powerful not just because people like videos, but because they're not just reading something, but they're seeing Eric and me talk about it, and we're talking about it with each other. And in in a way, it it it, it sneakily, subtly brings in that that more uh, personal side. So maybe more back to the question that you asked. I think you have to be willing to accept that there's going to be levels of what you mean by relationship. You're not going to be everybody's best buddy. That, that's not possible. It's not what we're talking about. But it, you know, it can go a tremendous long way to just respond to somebody. Uh, you know, it still means a lot to me when, when people who I really respect online, who have you know big followings, but they're they I know they know what they're talking about. I really admire them. Uh, I learn a lot from them, and I, I tweet something out or I put it somewhere else on social media, and you know I even just get a you know uh, hey thanks that was a good point Mark, and then that means you know instantly I feel like I've got that personal connection with them, and I know even though I do this for a living and I think about it consciously, you know I let myself be manipulated by that if you want to call it manipulation. I, it means something to me, and I know that it's going to color my every future interaction with them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are degrees of relationship, and you have to be willing to accept that and, and make use of that and the best of that that you can. Mm. And I think that's I think that's really really critical. I think that there are the way that we interact with people. There's still aspects of genuineness, authenticity. We still have conversations. We still do a lot of the things that we do in person, uh, but it does require us to um, be more intentional in certain aspects of that connection. I, I loved, in fact, in uh, in one of your articles, you showed a light. Uh, no, it was an electrical socket, and it because it has it has the plug, right? It has the two plugs up here, and then the the grounding plug at the bottom, and it was a circle instead of a square. Because it was a circle, we look at that, and instead of seeing an electrical socket, we see a smiley face going. Well, not a smiley face, an O face or whatever. It is, but we see a human face in that, and part of that is this this natural human nature to make connections with faces and uh, that the visual cues that drive connection. 
Yeah, I, I shared that because that just shows it's a um, it's a phenomenon that scientists call pareidolia, and it's our, just our tendency to see faces to recognize patterns and things. Uh, you know, it comes out of our evolutionary past. It helped us. It was a survival mechanism. Uh, obviously, it, it is beneficial to us to be able to recognize our own kind. But then we tend to see it everywhere. Um, interesting, you brought that up because there's an example that just came out that went viral this past week that I probably would have used that article instead of the electrical socket because it's so cool. And I'm a I'm a space and astronomy buff, uh, but there was a picture that NASA put out of this you know far away um, galaxy cluster or something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's a astronomical phenomena way way far away. The Hubble Space Telescope picked up, and it just happened to form like you know this, this form of like two two bright lights and a little light in the middle, and then a, a curvature of space, which they actually described it was. It was like a gravity curvature of gas that performed the smile at the bottom. And sure, there you know out in some Billions and billions of light years away is a smiley face in the sky. <laughs> wow. Um, so, you know, again, the, the bigger point for what we're talking about here is that, you know, it, it's programmed into our very natures to want to connect with other humans. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm preaching this. I think if you're serious about connecting to people with a message, and that, again, it doesn't just have to be a business message. As I said, it can be a cause that you have. It can be something you care about. If you're serious about that, Nothing beats if you can make the personal connection and add that into it. Mm -hmm. uh, Missy J has has a great question here. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna bring it up and I'm gonna rephrase it just a little bit. Uh, but she says, is there any way a newbie? Uh, she says to can cut corners to become successful with faster with their personal branding. I, I don't. I, I know Missy J enough. I don't think she means cutting corners in a negative sense. I think she means in terms of are there particular practical things that we can do to accelerate the process that it sometimes takes. Uh, is there any anything that you would have to say to that, Mark? Well, it might surprise some people that the first thing, when people ask me a question like that, the first thing that I emphasize to them has nothing to do with relationships or you know building your social media presence or any of those things that people would think about right away these days for personal branding. The first thing that I emphasize is your, your content. And whatever that means to you, it doesn't that, that can mean blog posts, it can mean videos, it can mean uh, you know stuff you're creating on LinkedIn or Google Plus or you know wherever it is. But I think the most important thing is that there be some substance there. Um, we see a lot of people out there today who have strong personal brands um, in terms of that they're famous, they're internet famous. But when you dig down deep, there's very little substance there. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be substance. So. Develop your area of expertise. Work hard at it. Gain knowledge. Learn all that you can. You've got to have something to give something. So feed that. That's number one. Then from there, find places where you can begin to share it in helpful, constructive ways. And that means more than just broadcasting, more than just bombing into a community and saying, like, I've got a great blog post. Here it is. But where you can go in... Um, to an existing conversation, existing community, wherever it is, and bring your, your content in helpfully and say, like, you know, I was looking at that very question and I was thinking about that and I came up with some research or some data, you know, here it is. Mm -hmm. When you share it that way, people are much more likely to want to click through on it, take a look at it. They see, wow, you know, Missy, she's got something, she, she knows her stuff. Um, and they're going to connect to you. And that's not always, I'm bringing up the example of, you know, sharing a link. It doesn't always have to be that. Just sharing your knowledge, being helpful to people, and you, you begin to get an audience. The third step, and there's a lot more to it than this, but I think the third step is to begin to pay attention to that audience. The, the first few people who begin to pay any attention to you, who begin to share your stuff, or regularly engage in your comments, or whatever it might be, um, let them know that they're important to you. You give reciprocity. Uh, you know, enter into their conversations. Um, you know, help them in what they're trying to do, and you build. And this is why it's important to emphasize that again. You know, the, the phrase "cut corners." Most people would take that to mean like, "What's the shortcut?" The last thing I'll say about this is you're going to have to be abundantly patient. Um, it takes time. Anybody who's done it well and successfully can tell you that. Um, you know, people see like. You know, wow, you're famous, you're successful, you're, you know, everybody looks at you for this or that. And few people understand or know 
about usually the many months and off quite more often years that that person put in with very little attention doing the work day after day before they got any of that notoriety. It takes years to become an overnight success. Yeah, that's a yeah, great, great quote. <laughs> yeah, and when I think that's I think that's dead on because before you come to a point where you, where you suddenly turn that corner and you start being and things start really catching, you've often failed at that corner numerous times. The difference is <laughs> you're failing at the point where nobody's paying attention to what you're doing. And so once you're actually figuring it out and you actually know what you're doing, then you suddenly begin getting visibility, which is, in all honesty, is probably better because when you get a lot of visibility for the things you're failing at, that doesn't help you. It helps you when you begin to establish uh, what you're doing and you begin to figure it all out and you know not just the information but how to do it, how to apply it. And then not only does that bring some of that attention, but it brings that attention at the right time. And let, let me throw in a very important tip on that very quickly, because uh, I see I see this happening to people, where you know they're they're working hard, they're doing what we're saying, they're they're trying to build great content, they're trying to enter conversations, and inevitably you see them say like, I've been doing this and doing this, and nobody pays any attention, nobody shares my stuff, nobody comments on my posts, and they begin to assume when that attitude goes sour, when they begin to think like it's it's everybody else. You know, people just don't get it. Blah 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 blah. You know, you need to what I you need to become self reflective, like I talked about earlier. And it doesn't mean getting down on yourself. It doesn't mean you know, that's self destructive. It means being willing to take a step back and say, this relates to what you were just saying, Thomas, is there something that I'm doing that's just not resonating with my audience. It can be anything from the information, is it really not that unique, not that special, to the presentation. You know, is, it, is it the way I'm presenting things, the way I'm talking about it? Am I being too pushy with people? Am I not being pushy enough? I mean, it can be both, both problems. You've got to be willing to assess and try different things. Um, and if you keep at it, you know, eventually, as you say, you'll start to find the things that click and then you build on those. Yeah, I think that's. Um, <laughs> I couldn't have said that better. So we're just going to move on. Frederick has a great question. Frederick here. has a great question here. Yep. Yep. Yeah, com comment tracker seems to always kind of get tired toward the end of a show. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out where some of that echo came. Trying to figure out where some of that echo came. Oh. But here we go. But here we go. I'm still hearing an echo, but if you guys are hearing me, let me know. Frederick wanted to know this. Frederick wanted to motivate us to help people with Google Local Guides and Google Maps. Hold on, I know where that echo is coming from. Give me one second. It says, Google motivates us to help people with Google Local Guides and Google Maps views. Do they also attach more importance to personal branding in the future? And I'm assuming he means, will they uh, attach more importance to personal branding in the future, uh, Mark? And I know this is right up your alley. What do you think about that? Oh, hold on. You're muted. Let me unmute you. Okay. There we go. No. <laughs> okay. okay, now you're good. The mute, the mute keeps jumping back and forth. All right, um, I, that's a great question. Boy, we could do another whole show about that. But one of the great, one of the big questions that came up when Google killed Google authorship, some people assumed, well, that's the end. Google decided like authors don't matter. I don't believe that for a moment. First of all, they were still getting patents um, in place, uh, and remember, patents usually, if they use them at all, they come years often before uh, a feature is actually made use of. But at the time that they were killing off authorship, they were still getting new patents having to do with author authority, with personal authority. So it's something that they're very interested in. Um, very quickly, what I think the future of that is, is that we're going to see it much more integrated into the overall um, ranking system of Google in more subtle ways. I think authorship, one of the faults with it was that it was too out in front, it was too much of an advantage for people that knew how to um, operate it, knew how to connect it. 
I think it's going to become more automatic in the future, and that is that there, with the knowledge graph, um, the ability to more and more at scale identify real entities, means real people in the real world, and connect that with their content, they'll be able to much more honestly and, uh, what I want to say, um, uh, objectively determine who are the real authorities in a topic and then boost that. So the short answer to that is yes, I think it will become increasingly important as the years go by. We're probably still some distance off from where we really see that implemented in Google. Hmm. Uh, we're running right near the end of our time. I want to highlight uh, two things uh, real quick before we, uh, before we close up. Um, Andrea had a great point here when, and I asked about echoing, and you'll enjoy this, Mark. She says, yes, it's echoing, but more importantly, I saw Mark Trapagan speak to someone with beer. So, busted. I don't know if I'm on camera yet, but I'll allow, I'll allow myself to be busted. There it is. You've been through an ice storm, folks. Have some mercy on me. <laughs> uh, okay, last question. I think this is just a clarification. Um, all the studios uh, wanted to know, and he does some cartoon stuff that's really great. You guys need to check his stuff out. But he's saying, uh, are you saying, this is in reference back to when you were talking about the way that you bring some of your content into the conversations and how you share links and some of that type of stuff. He wants to know, are you, are you talking about how you repurpose the content for different social outlets or in terms of uh, looking for and waiting for opportunities to share your content? Well, I was, I was talking uh, really about the latter, about opportunities to share, but I think, I think both are important. Um, if you watch me, if you watch Thomas, you'll see both of us doing this for big believers and repurposing your content, which simply means that once you've got a really great piece of content, there can be multiple different ways to share it. You can turn it into a video, you can turn it into a slide deck, you can turn it into an infographic, and the value of that is that different people like to get their information different ways. So, you know, that, that's certainly valuable. But I was talking more about the latter, which is uh, that you, your content becomes a bank that you can draw from and uh, gives you the ability to help people in very substantive ways. Uh, when I go into a conversation, I'm not always going to have time to re-explain to somebody, you know, in a 16-paragraph comment, everything that they need to know. But I, if I can say to them, in a non-spammy way, because it truly is helping them, saying like, "Hey, I wrote a whole post about that. Here it is." Then I just draw from that bank, and I've still got the benefit of them connecting that to, "Wow, Mark Trapagan really helped me." What a great analogy that your content is like a bank, and you draw from it in order to, uh, in order to invest in different areas. I think that's that's a fantastic, fantastic connection. We're running out of our time here. Mark, why don't you tell us where we can find you at? This is a question I love to get asked these days because uh, you know, if, I, if there's any proof of, of anything that I've been able to accomplish online, it's this. Um, just Google Mark Trapagan. Uh, as I said to, to Thomas before the show started, if you can spell my last name correctly, you can find me. Um, I'm the whole first page of Google. Uh, and that, you know, that, again, is just something that's happened from years of investment online of building my brand. That helps to have a fairly unique name. Um, but, you know, just, just to put it in perspective, there's another Mark Trapagan out there who's a fairly famous intellectual property lawyer, getting a lot of, got a lot of news coverage in the past. So I had some competition for it. Um, but, yeah, just, just Google me. You'll find all the places where I hang out online. So what you're saying is that Google recognizes that you are the leading authority on Mark Trapagan. Yes. Yeah, that will be, if I could put nothing else on my business card, I am the world's leading authority on Mark Trapagan. <laughs> Excellent. Personal brand for the win. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you all for, for being here for for this show. Uh, you can find me. My name is Thomas Ihani. You can find me right here on Google. If you're on Twitter, you can find me at uh, Blog Photo TV, uh, or you can just go straight to my website, which is blogphoto.tv, and I'll be happy to make connections there. Drop me a line. Let me know that you were here. I'd love to get connected, and I'll be lingering for a little while here in the comment section, uh, so feel free to continue the conversation. Thank you, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>